Now, some people have those, Greg. Some people have those from last week. So if you, I forgot to lay out the handouts, so that's why I'm a few minutes behind. I had to go to my office to get them. If you do not have the handouts from last week, raise your hand and Greg will give you a, a copy. Uh, thank you so much for that help, Greg. Uh, so, yes, just raise your hand high and Greg will give you a, a copy. Got one, got a couple over here on this side. Most of you probably have those from last week. Although I do think we ran out last week. I, I, think, I think I printed about 50 and we ran out. So that's, that's good. You always want to have more people. And so... <clears throat> all right. Very good. Good to see all of you here this morning. Hope you're having a, a wonderful morning as we're beginning a new day, a new week, and a new month. Here we are at June the 2nd, our first Sunday together for the month of June. So, Lord willing, at the end of this month, we'll have half of this year in the history books. Are you holding to your New Year's resolution? It's always a good time, June and July, to go back and check and see if you're holding to that New, year, new Year's resolution or... Maybe it just wasn't worth it, and that's all right. <laughs> but uh, we're uh, so happy to see you here. June will be a busy month for us. Our summer series begins this Wednesday night, our One Another theme with Brad Adcock from Stony Point coming to speak to us uh, this coming uh, Wednesday night. And um, also uh, Vacation Bible School coming up here at Wood Avenue uh, in a couple weeks. There's a lot uh, in the area, I think about four in the area beginning today, um, Petersville and Salem, Mount Zion and Tuscumbia, at least are the four that I know about, and then there's some next week, but then of course ours is the third week of June, and um, the theme this year is Jesus the Great Physician, that Sunday is also Father's Day, it worked out pretty good last year to begin VBS on Father's Day. And there is an adult class every night, Sunday through Wednesday, with James Sin teaching the adult class. So I hope that you will plan to be here every night as well. And uh, he will follow our VBS theme uh, that, that week. So, so a lot going on. A lot of our members are at Wiregrass uh, this week. Um, so... Uh, a lot of our members have helped with that, especially geared around our college students have helped with that. So we certainly want to keep uh, them in our prayers as well. Do we have other prayer requests? Good to see Judy here with us. Okay. Judy did have her biopsy. They're going to do robotic surgery at, at UAB, Birmingham, of course. And um, she has a call on June the 17th, but the surgery has not yet been scheduled. So we certainly want to keep, continue to keep Judy Barber in our prayers. Any other prayer requests this morning? All right, very good. All right, let's, uh, let's pray and we'll have our Bible class. Our God and Holy Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and your rich love and blessings and the time that we can come together and assemble together with one another. And we're thankful for our, our Bible class hour. We're thankful for our teachers and our classes. Father, we're, we're mindful that during these summer months, uh, we'll have a lot of guests with us, but also a lot of our members will be traveling. And we ask your blessings to be upon all as they, they travel and uh, uh, that you'll bless them with safety. We pray for our group that's at Wiregrass that they can do much good uh, this week in teaching the gospel to those who are at that camp as well as other camps, Maywood, and so many opportunities to teach children uh, through, the, through the work of camp. And we're thankful, uh, Father, for these opportunities. We're thankful for what the summer months will provide for us with our, our summer series and our vacation Bible school. We pray that... Uh, much good will come from our efforts and, and the planning and the preparation, as well as the, the, the preachers and teachers and the time that they've put forth, that, uh, that we will, uh, you will be glorified and we will be strengthened uh, through, these, through these efforts. Father, we uh, continue to pray for our sister Judy Barber. We 
Pray that all will be well with her and her health and that when it is time for surgery that, uh, that all will go well and that her health will be strong uh, for it. Just pray that she'll have a strong faith through this. We're so thankful to have Trey back with us. We thank you, Father, for his uh, health and his recovery up to this point. We're thankful for those who cared for him. And, Father, we ask that you continue to bless him and, and his recovery. May we all seek to please you and to glorify you in all that we do and, and always give you our very, very best. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we are beginning on page three, and then we'll go back to page two. Uh, this handout, these handouts were given to you last week, the divided kingdom. And so it, I talked to a couple different people last week after class about maybe trying to change this to a timeline format, make it a little easier to follow. And I will continue to work on that. I worked on it a little yesterday, but the challenge is that I'm coming up with is making it flow on a timeline and getting the information in there that I want to get in. So I'll, I'll see what I can do with that. And I have some timelines already in my office that I've picked up from other people, but um, I'm just trying to make a, I'll, so I, I will work on that a little more to see if I can find a way to accomplish both. But what I'm trying to do uh, with this is help, help you to see what kings overlapped one another. Because, for example, we're beginning on number seven under the kings of Israel, page three, Ahab. But um, that does not mean that, he was, that, that, that his, his reign was at the same time as, as the number seven in the kings of Judah. So, um, so I'm go, I'll try to make sure I uh, let you know because, because of different times. Because of different times. For example, just, just go back to page two for just a minute. For example, um, you know, we started with Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the first two kings, but Rehoboam was, reigned only 17 years and Jeroboam reigned 22 years. So Jeroboam's reign was all of Rehoboam's, was all of Abijam's, and some of Asa's. And so that's kind of why we're, we're going back and forth. So what we did last week is we continued on in the kings of Israel to get us down to uh, where we're ready to begin today with Ahab. And then we will jump back to Asa. And so that's, I know it's confusing. It's confusing for me. But hopefully we can follow the handouts together and it will make sense. Ultimately, we just have to read the books <laughs> of First and Second Kings because that's where it's laid out. And they even go back and forth. If, if you read these books from where the divided kingdom begins in First Kings 12, you know, he'll give you a king of the north, then a king of the south, then a king of the north, then a king of the south. And he goes back and forth showing where they overlap. The, the writers, of course, the writer goes back and forth showing where they overlap. So I, I know it can be a little confusing, and I will try my best to make it um, as, under, as, as, as easy to understand as, as we can. But we're ready to begin today with Ahab. That's number seven, the top of page three, Kings of Israel. And I was actually reading something this morning. It was interesting, uh, a book written by Michael Whitworth about the kingdom is titled how to lose a kingdom in 400 years and it's been interesting up to this point and uh he he was noticing how the seventh king is the most evil uh up to this point the seventh king and then he talks about the seventh king of judah and how evil he was and then the 14th king so that might be something of interest to you as you count these kings uh that perhaps that completeness and complete evil that you see in some of these people. But uh, remember, it all began when you're talking about the kings of Israel. That's the northern ten tribes. It all began, uh, began with Jeroboam and the kingdom divided. God told him, remember, God told him, I'm going to give you these ten tribes. So God told him, I'll give them to you, and you remain faithful to me, and I'll bless you. The problem is he did not remain faithful. That's the problem. And he, and he started the idol worship, the calf worship. And then from there, it keeps progressing down they keep going in that downward spiral of sinfulness and, and Ahab of course he's one of the better known kings of Israel and the divided kingdom probably because of Ahab and Jezebel Jezebel and of course his wife and uh, you know their his kingship is is laced in with Elijah and the prophet Elijah it's, it's right there with Elijah so so that's going to make him a little better known than most of these kings we see in uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, beginning in verse 29, 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 29, 
that he was the son of Omri and he was evil. Remember, not was, I might stand corrected as we go through this study where I missed something, but I do not think one king of the northern kingdom, Israel, has ever said that he was good. Okay? I, and most every one of them, it says he was evil. But I do not recall, I do not think as I was going through the notes um, and through reading these books that one king, it was ever said he was good. Jehu, I think it does not say he was evil, but it does not say he was good either. So with these, southern, these northern kings, Israel, uh, they, are, they are all evil. So he's the son of Omri, and he did evil. First Kings chapter 16 and verse 29. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. So again, if you're looking at your handout, that's the third king of Judah. So that's, that's, they don't always line up. So it's, so it's the seventh king of Israel, but it's only the third king of Judah, if you're looking at your, your handout. So in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. That's the northern tribes. And Ahab, the son of Omri, uh, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And this is what happens. You see this in the Bible. You just see this in life in general. When people begin going away from God and righteousness and morals, then, then it just becomes more and more corrupt and more sinful. You know, we have benefited from the nation, especially this area of the nation, that uh, the Bible has been taught and respected for so many years. Even for most of us in our lifetime, those who did not necessarily go to church, there was still that, that influence to, to do good and treat one another in, in a good way. Not that everyone has always done right, not that there's never been any problems or sin, but you, you see the, the effect and the influence of God's Word filtering through society, even for those who don't, do not even necessarily believe in God or go to church, but their, their influence may be by family, uh, growing up or whatever it might be, teachers, even at school, to do good. But on the other hand, you see, you see that flowing when it's, it's sinful. And you think, oh man, how could, could it get any worse? Well, just, just wait till the next generation. <laughs> and then the next and the next. I mean, it's just, it's just what happens. Yes, it can. You know, there's things happening now that we would never have thought would have happened. But, you know, be, before we say it could never be this bad, let's just hang on and see what happens. However, at the same time, that doesn't mean give up hope because as we're going through the books of First and Second Kings, we're seeing faithful men and women like Elijah, like Elisha, like Micaiah, like some of these other, even in the captivity, like Daniel and his friends, um, so that's something we must remember, regardless of what's going on around us, regardless of how bad we might think things are, there's still the faithful out there who are faithful to God. And we all must choose if we're going to be the faithful or not. So continuing on, it came to pass as though, verse 31, it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now that is the first king of Israel, Jeroboam. The son of Nebat. Now he's having to let us know who he is because, again, we're going to come across a second Jeroboam a little later in the kingdom. Then he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Now you're seeing this, again, this, this progression away from God. Now what Jeroboam did was wrong, obviously, in setting up and establishing the idol worship. But now you're going... Uh, a little more. You're going to um, serving Baal and worshiping him. And isn't it interesting that you see the same thing happening to Ahab that you saw happen to Solomon, a, a, a wife from a foreign nation, a foreign people. And that happened to Solomon, of course. He married Pharaoh's daughter. He married women from all of the nations around. He married them or there were concubines. And, and again, that, that, that's what it comes back to. That's what it comes back to. Like not, not that they were of other nations or languages or whatever it might be, race, but that they were serving these idol gods. That's, that's what it all boils down to. And the same would be true today when it comes to Christians. You know, if uh, the influence is there, friends, marriage, whatever it might be, then there is a greater chance that I'm going to be influenced to leave God and pull away from God rather than remain faithful to him. 
So this king, Ahab, uh, like his wife. Now he's going to worship Baal. Uh, then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provide, excuse me, more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Now you go through those first six, and then you even think about Solomon, David, and Saul. <laughs> this isn't who you want to be. <laughs> you know, more than all who were before him. And he provoked the Lord to anger. And this is what we must read. To be reminded about the long suffering of God. Because we're going to get into 2 Kings. Where the northern kingdom Israel goes into Assyrian captivity. And then finally they all go into Babylonian captivity. If you just pick up the Bible and start reading right there. You think well why would God let that happen? Here's your answer. The question is how did God allow evil to go on as long as he allowed it to go on? Your answer is in 1 John chapter 4. God is love. He waited and waited and waited and waited. And he even, as we're going to see, used Ahab to accomplish some good for Israel according to his will. And using Ahab to defeat the Syrian army not once but twice. So like Nebuchadnezzar um, and, 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 and these other evil kings, you know, the, the nation of Israel, some of their kings are just as bad as Ahab. I mean, excuse me, yeah, yeah, just as bad as Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, they, they might not have risen to the world power the way Nebuchadnezzar did, but what they're doing is just as bad. But we see God using people to accomplish his will, whether they're good or bad. And, and my response to that is I want to be on God's side. He's going to use me either way. I want to be on, the, I want to be on his good side. I, I, want, I want to be on his good side. I want, to, I want to stay on the side that it's all right in eternity. Um, so... Uh, so just because he was doing all this that's wrong doesn't mean that God can't use him to accomplish what he needs done. So, um, so verse 33, uh, provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger more than all the kings of Israel who were before him. That's, that's, that's a verse to remember. In his days, uh, Hael of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundations with Abram, his firstborn, with his youngest son, Segub, he set up its gates according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through Joshua, the son of Nun. And we talked about that a little bit last week. If you go back to Joshua chapter 6 and verse 26, God said, do not rebuild this. But they did it. And the point is, of course, uh, children. That, that's just a reminder that God's word is, is, in fact, it's nailed down and he's not going to leave it. You know, all these years passed, but God said, look, if you do it, this is what's going to happen. Now, who's at fault? Not God. God told them what would happen. The people, for not going back as the kings and the priests and the people were supposed to do, and study and know. And the same is true today, of course. Um, if we find ourselves on the wrong side of God on Judgment Day, it's not God's fault. <clears throat> it'll, be, it'll be our fault for not spending time in the Scripture and, and, and knowing the word of God and knowing what God expects of us. You know, sometimes, uh, I'll admit, sometimes maybe have free time and just thinking, letting my mind wander. And you think about you know, all of the world, all of the world, atheists, evolutionists, world religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, all of the world. And even within Christianity, thousands of thousands. And sometimes I think, are, are we sure we're right? <laughs> I do. You might not. I do. I think, you know, I want to be, I want to be certain because you have all these other people saying no. And, but it's, it's times like this, it helps to confirm my faith that God said from the beginning of time, yes, there's one way and it's my way. Now that one way was different for Eve, don't eat of the fruit than it is for me and you. And that one way was different for the Israelites Worship according to the Levitical priesthood with offering these animal sacrifices and abstaining from certain food to eat, observing the Sabbath day. That's different under that system than it is for our system. But the fact remains the same. God has always said, I am the one way. And that helps to confirm my faith that, uh, yeah, we, 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 we must stay in this one way.
that God has given us. And that's just something that I, that I think about. Um, thoughts, or, thoughts or comments on this reading, verses 29 through 34, or Ahab as we're getting into Ahab. Again, we'll spend a little more time with him than some of the other kings just because he, he takes up a, a lot. Of, he's going to take up the rest of First Kings, actually. Um, now, the kings of Judah are also mingled in here. We're about to jump back to Judah a little later. But as far as the kings of the north, uh, Ahab, you know, there's, there's 30, uh, 22, 22 chapters. And, and he's going to take the rest of the book. So there's a lot of time and attention given to this evil king Ahab who did more evil than all who were before him. Did I see? Did I? Yes. Mm-hmm. I had a thought. Mainly it, was, it had to do with the uh, amount of effort Ahab put in after Jezebel took over the recipient of the generational blessings that the Israelites were given by God taking them out and knows of the stories of them coming out of Egypt and the wanderings and the blessings and seeing God with them and, and, and he's gone full force against God and headed in such a direction and I was I was dumbfounded as I'm sitting here trying to contemplate, you know, with foresight of course, how all that transpires, but I, I returned it back to people. We do the same thing. You know, we see God's blessings, know God's blessings, yet, as you pointed out, thousands of denominations exist because they, they, don't, they want something different than what God has given. Uh, they want something more than what God has authorized, or, or they want to contend against even in some other religion. So I guess I'm, I've circled myself all the way back to I ain't mean, nothing new. And it's all the same. Sure. Yes, yes absolutely. You do say, and that's a good point, how he just dives straight into this and the effort of he, he's, he's trying to get away from God. You know, and again, you see, and I mentioned this last week in our introduction, uh, you know, I would say that the beginning of their decline was not when the kingdom divided, but it's way back in 1 Samuel when they said, set us a king over us. And God said, um, they've not rejected you to Samuel said they've not rejected you that rejected me that I should not be king over them and when we reject God then yeah uh, it's you know but there again I do think you see we, we, we're seeing in Ahab because remember I believe this is the third time the kingdom has changed in the north now the south remains the seat of David descendants of David because God had made that promise but in the north you get two or three kings and then it One's assassinated and it changes to a different family. And with each change and with each generation, with each child, you know, again, if, 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 if he's seeing his dad as evil as he was, then, you know, if he's not guided back to truth, then he's going to take the next step. And, and, and you'll, you'll, see, you'll see quite often, not always is that the case. Sometimes you see children raised in ungodly homes and they say, this is not what I want. I'm going exact opposite. Sometimes, unfortunately, you see children raised in godly homes, and they choose to rebel. That I realize that, but at the same time, for the most part, you follow. You follow what's doing, what you're doing, and what you see and what you know. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just it's sad to see what can happen, what did happen to the nation of Israel. And remember, from beginning, Saul. All the way to captivity, only about four centuries, 400 to 450 years. It's not that long until they lose it all. Not that long. And you could think of it like this the height of their kingdom, not necessarily spiritually, but as an economy and, and, and strength and, 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 and the days of Solomon. Well, that's down to closer to 300 years, you know, to go from there to straight down that nosedive. <laughs> Look at the, the enthusiasm of when those who are raised in church versus those who are in conference. And, you know, and I'm not, it's, it's not necessarily true for everything, for Asian, for Russian, but, you know, you look at the enthusiasm that the conference had, and a lot of times it's greater than those of us who are raised in church. And I wonder if that's somewhat, I wonder if that's not kind of a similar thing. You know, 
back back then, you know, they, they, they just saw the blessing to sort of go, you know, should have been. This is ours, you know, this is what we're entitled to, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, and we run the same page, of course, as parents, and how do we pass on? Sure. Yeah. You see both. You see. You, you see. You, I agree. Yeah. You see those who come in. They they know what the world is like. They know what it offers, and they just come in and they're on fire. Um, you know. But there again, you 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 still you see those who were raised in the church and remain faithful uh, all of life and remain on fire. But yeah, it's always good to see that enthusiasm, that zeal. Um, you know, it all goes back to Romans ten seventeen. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Um, you know, whether we're converted later in life or we're raised in the church, whenever we, like these kings that we're talking about, whenever we begin to distance ourselves away from study, away from scripture, then, you know, we're going in that direction to where it's easier to sin. And uh, maybe we don't even realize it in the beginning if we've been in the church for some time. Uh, I know older preachers uh, warned younger preachers, myself included, many, many times uh, seems like that 10-year mark was always like a, a, a troubling year, like a burnout year or something. And I've, I've heard that from older preachers so, so many times of, uh, you know, you, you get in and knew the preaching, you're on fire, and you, you're enjoying it. But, you know, when your, quote, job is also supposed to be your life, you know, in the sense of you, you study as a person, but then you're also studying to present lessons, you know, they, they talked about burnout is a lot of times when preachers, the 10th year, burn out. Not always leaving the church. Sometimes, unfortunately, they do. But sometimes just moving out of ministry into something else. And, my, and I'll just say this. I won't try to go down this road too far. But my, my response is, look, it'd be better to get out of the ministry than to lose your soul. <laughs> if that's what you need to do, that, that's, that's fine. There's nothing that says you have to stay in the ministry. But I, I said that to, 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 to build on this comment of saying that, Burnout is a real thing, whether in the ministry or not. And that's why we must always um, make sure that we're finding ways to stay in Scripture. And, and you know, when we're having those, those difficult times, not leave God. But you can see the wisdom of God in calling us together as a church to encourage one another. Um, fellowship is not an act of worship, I realize. But we can't go to heaven without it either because the church is commanded to assemble together. And... Uh, you know, and I'm not placing humans on the same level as the Word of God, but in the Word of God, He gave us Christian fellowship. And I can say I'm a member of the church today uh, because of brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, because because those who have helped me through the years to to remain faithful, and and that's another thing you need to think about with these people is the influence. Uh, the ungodly influence that starts and then it just keeps progressing and even now with Ahab and this wicked, wicked woman Jezebel and um, you know it's so much easier for him to be swept away uh, by her and uh, so it does go back to that influence and you can see God saying no the church needs to be together uh, and there's a reason the church needs to be together there's a reason the church needs to assemble together um, because what it does for us, and that 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 would be my my biggest concern with what we offer online. I know there's a need for it. I've used it many times, and I'm thankful for it. But if we ever get in our minds that that offers the same as assembling together, then we we're wrong, and we've missed it. it. It's good when we can't be here, but if we think, even if I'm just traveling on vacation, I say, well, it's easy enough to listen to a sermon driving down the road. No, 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 no. I've, I've missed the mark. There's, there's something that the assembly together, the assembling together with brothers and sisters in Christ does for us that we can't get anywhere else. And, and, and we, that, that, that is so important that we realize that. Any other thoughts, thoughts or comments on the, these few verses that we've been, been looking at? Okay, notice if you continue in your notes, the Lord delivers Syria to Ahab twice. So, that, so, so remember, so you pick up Elijah. If you're following along in your Bible, he leaves Ahab. He leaves all the kings, uh, the, in the, the, this book does. If chapter 17 uh, and 18, well, he picks back up with Ahab in 18. But, but the, the, we inter, we're introduced to Elijah, one of our non-writing prophets. Uh, much, of course, is said about him. 
Uh, remember, they even thought that Jesus uh, was uh, Elijah or John the Baptist was Elijah. And you have these prophecies uh, about John the Baptist and how he would be similar to Elijah. But So the Bible, in chapter 17, 18, and 19, is going to uh, uh, let us know what we need to know about the prophet Elijah uh, during a drought. He had prayed for a drought, three and a half years without rain, of course. The Lord sends him to the widow of Zarephath. She takes care of him. And then he has this great victory in chapter 18, beginning of verse 20. Now, Ahab is still mentioned here because Ahab's the king. And note, you remember Elijah's victory is over the prophets of, of Baal. So let's, let's just notice that. Uh, chapter 18 of verse 20, this is not in your notes, but, uh, but let's notice that as we're making our way forward throughout the life of Ahab. So chapter 18, uh, verse 20, remember it's a drought uh, Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the pe people answered him not a word. Now, it's, there's prophets throughout, keep in mind. Faithful men and women throughout. We know this because a little later in chapter uh, 19, God says, I still have 7,000 who have not bow bowed to Baal. So... So they're there, they, but God the Holy Spirit is giving us this information about Elijah, I believe, because what you find is this King Ahab who has done more evil than all who were before him and who has brought in this form of worship. And, and God is showing to us, this, this is what I did about it. So there at Mount Carmel, verse 21, and Elijah is saying to the people, now think, think of what it's like to be Elijah. Um, here before this evil king and this evil woman, and you can see how scared he is of them in chapter 19 because he flees for his life and he begs the Lord to just let him die. So you, you can see what he's up against. And uh, so they, Elijah does feel like he's alone in verse 22. He'll, re, be, he'll find out later, no, he's not alone. But sometimes we feel like that, don't we? Sometimes we feel like we're all alone. That's one point to remember when you're thinking about giving up is realize that you're not alone. Um, so there's 450 men, the prophets of Baal, verse 22. So they're building this altar to call on the name. They call on their God. And Elijah kind of mocks them, makes fun of them. We see in verse 26. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. So it was at noon that Elijah mocked them, verse 27, and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So, so Elijah is making, he's mocking them. He's making fun of them. He's saying, oh, well, maybe, maybe he's just not here. Maybe, maybe he's taking a nap, you know. And then... Um, so they cry aloud. They cut themselves, verse 28, which is still common in some religions. Uh, if you ever get the Voice of Truth International, you can see actual pictures from some Middle Eastern countries uh, where they'll, they'll do that. And it, the photos of them running through the streets with these large gashes and cutting themselves. Still, still common in some places. So uh, as was their cut. I mean, at least not the, you know, the 
typical way we would think of death, you know, death being sort of that goes into like say just a funny thought I had. <laughs> That's right, yeah. I'm I've thought about that myself. In 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah's taken in the whirlwind. So here's a prayer that, he would, that was never answered. A faithful man of God, when, you, when you're questioning God and you're questioning prayer and why is God not answering the prayers that I pray, here is a man of God, a prophet of God who stood at the face of evil, the most evil up to that point in the king, stood at the face of evil that could have killed him at any moment. And Elijah stands up for what is right. And yet God, like you said, never answers that prayer yes because Elijah does not die in the sense of death. Hebrews 9, 27, but he's taken and changed, obviously, 2 Kings chapter 2. But I thought about that myself. Yeah, you're right. I mean, here, here's, here's a prayer of a faithful man of God, but God never answers it. And what we're, what we're talking about here, if you get into chapter 19, we're still looking at Ahab the king and his wife Jezebel. When you get into chapter 19, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. 450. Now, there again, when we insert ourselves into the text, I've, I've said many times, you know, which, which king do you want to be? It's the same could be true for which prophet do you want to be? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm thankful that I've, I've lived a life of relative peace up to this point, but you think about the prophets who were tortured, the prophets who were thrown in prison, the prophets who were beaten, and the prophets who were even killed for their faith. And then think about what Elijah has done here in having these 450 killed with the sword. In verse 2, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, notice this also. Remember God said, we talked about this way back in the book of Deuteronomy, for the kings to not multiply wives, nor take a wife of a foreign country. And now here is a foreign queen being the wife of a king who in scripture seems that she is just as powerful or maybe more so than him. I mean, she is calling the shots in many, many ways. And uh, so she sends messengers to Elijah in verse 2. So let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. There's a sermon there. In 24 hours, Elijah, you'll, Elijah, Elijah, 24 hours, you'll be dead. And she had the power to do it. So that would be reason, as David was just talking about here in verse 3 of chapter 19. When he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. So he's leaving the north, where he had this great victory, now he's going back into Judah and getting down into Judah, uh, where, 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 he, where he's going back, back down there uh, and uh, left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough now, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. Yes, sir. Yes, he was way like Mount Carmel, this way in the northern kingdom. He wasn't just right across the line. Like where he said he was scared. Sure. Of course he was. He was in the hard part of the northern kingdom. Yes, yes, yes. Great point. Uh, Dale's pointing out how he's way up north in Mount Carmel. You know, we'll see later Amos will go across the border from Tekoa into Bethel, but he's just across. It's still bad for him, bad enough. But he, like I say, he's just across the border uh, where, um, where, where, where Elijah is, is, is on up there. And he's in the heart of this sinful nation and this sinful people. You must appreciate that. You know, think, think about it. Are we ready to walk into some nations and do what Elijah did here? You know, are we, are we ready to do that? Um, you know, uh, you, 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 you see what can happen. Uh, sadly, what was it a week ago, that young missionary couple, I'm not sure what church they were with, but you know, they were, they, they and one other was, was murdered in Haiti, uh, what last week. And they, they, they looked to be very young. Uh, you know, there's a lot, you know, we, again, we're, we're not, we're here in peace this morning, but you, you try to put yourself into this situation where, um, as, as Dale was saying, you're, you're way up there, you're on Mount Carmel, you had this great victory. But now, so now he's running back to Judah. He's, getting, he's doing what he, he knows to do to, to try to be safe. Because remember, the kingdom divided, something we looked at last week, the kingdom's divided. They're still working together at times. We see at times 
they're, they're allies and they work together to, um, to go to battle against other nations. But at the same time, they are two, in fact, separate kingdoms. So he gets back to Judah where um, he gets back to Judah where the southern kings are. Now remember, so, so this, is, this is where it's good to keep this in mind. Look back on page two. Look back on page two. And you find, so this was, you have Kings 3 and 4, Asa and Jehoshaphat. So Asa, of course, was one of the good kings, was one of the good kings of the south. Um, I'll have to check and see how much, because he, he, he overlapped Ahab by only three years. So I'd have to check and see at what point did Elijah come into place. It was in those first three years or not. Either way, he's getting back to the south. He's getting back to Judah. He's getting back to those who are worshiping at the temple. But as was mentioned, he's praying to die. And the Lord, if we get to 2 Kings chapter 2, never answers that prayer. If you read the rest of this chapter, you might want to read the rest of this chapter later today. This, to me, was one of the greatest sources of comfort during 2020. I don't know who it was who put this out there. But uh, someone used this text as a, a text of comfort of um, what to do when you feel like you're all alone. 2020 COVID, everything's locked down. Elijah thought, I'm all alone. As he said, I'm the only one here. And God sends him three people by name. And it says, oh yeah, but also there's 7,000. The point is you're never alone. Well, thank you so much for your time. We, we, uh, we still have more. Again, Ahab's going to take the rest of the book. So we're going to spend a little time with Ahab, but um, we will we'll pick up here next week. Thank you so much for your time.